In this lesson, we're going to talk about cell transport. So in our last lesson, we talked about cell membranes and cell boundaries, and we talked about the functions of those cell membranes. And one of the functions of the cell membranes was to regulate the transport of materials from one side of the membrane to the other. Remember that the four functions were to regulate, separate, protect, and support. We said that regulation of materials across the membrane was the most important uh, characteristic. So that movement is going to be determined by the concentration and the amount of energy required. So the concentration is simply a measure of the mass of solute in a given volume. So now let's go ahead and take a look at the different types of cell transport. So first up, we have passive transport. So that passive transport can be just movement directly through the membrane, again from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. It can also use, remember we talked about those proteins that were embedded in the membrane, it can use those proteins as a carrier molecule or a channel protein also moving things from an area of high concentration to an area of lower concentration. And this is called facilitated diffusion because facilitated diffusion needs a carrier, needs some help, but it still moves from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And then finally, we're going to end up talking about something called active transport. And when you think of active, you should think action. And if you're being active or there's action going on, you're going to need energy, and that energy is going to be in the form of ATP, which stands for adenosine triphosphate, and this is going to be the cellular energy. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at passive transport. So the first type of passive transport we're going to discuss is called diffusion. And diffusion is a type of transport that does not require energy. Not only does it not require energy, it is also going to not need a carrier protein. And it is going to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And we call this movement with the gradient. So let's go ahead and take a look at this in action. So here we have our phospholipid bilayer. And then we have this integral protein. So we have a channel protein here, but we're not going to use the protein. If you watch these molecules as they move through the membrane, you're going to see that they're actually moving through the phospholipid bilayer. And in this case, what we are moving is water molecules. And when this happens, this is going to be called osmosis. So osmosis is the movement of water from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration that does not require energy and does not need to go through any of the carrier proteins. So let's go ahead and back that up and take another look at it. So if you notice again here, we've got an area of high concentration of water molecules and an area of low concentration up here. So as we go through the animation again, you will notice that the molecules move through the phospholipid bilayer, not through the integral protein. And again, this is called osmosis. So the next type of passive transport is going to be called facilitated diffusion. Now if you notice here, I have labeled this particular integral protein an aquaporin. And what that means, it's a water pore. So remember we talked about how water molecules are polar, and polar molecules do not tend to move through the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, water was an exception, but again, it's only going to move in a very small amounts through the actual phospholipid bilayer. Where the majority of your water is going to move through is through this process called facilitated diffusion, is through these aquaporins. So let's go ahead and take a look at this animation. Remember, this is facilitated diffusion. So it is diffusion. It's going to go from an area of high concentration to an area of lower concentration. It's not going to need energy but it is going to move the water molecules through these aquaporins. So let's take a look at this particular animation. And if you notice that the water molecules moved through the aquaporin. Again, that's different from when we talked about osmosis. 
because osmosis, the molecules moved directly through the membrane. All right, so let's go ahead and get back and talk about osmosis. So when we're talking about osmosis, remember we are talking about water movement from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. Okay, and when we say that, let's take a look at this particular uh, YouTube here, not YouTube, the video service, a YouTube. All right, and if you take a look over here on the right hand side, we have a very concentrated solution. There's lots and lots of solute dissolved in this particular solution of water. Over here, we have more water, okay? So we have the higher concentration of water here, right? But we have a lower concentration of the solute materials. And then we have a semi-permeable membrane, which is going to illustrate or take the place of, I should say, our biological membrane, okay? So what is going to happen to the water? Well, if you take a look, Osmosis is the diffusion of water. Now, for osmotic solutions, we're going to actually define them by the solute of their concentration. In other words, this osmotic solution over here is going to be considered to be hypotonic because it has a low solute concentration. Hypo, H-Y-P-O, means low. Over here, this is going to be a hypertonic solution, okay? And what's going to happen is the water is going to move from the hypotonic side to the hypertonic side, right? Causing something called osmotic pressure. It's the pressure that builds on the hypertonic side of the membrane. Remember, hypertonic meaning higher solute concentration. There's many, many more solute molecules on this side of the uh, U-tube. So again, we're going to define the osmotic solutions by the solute they contain. So I mentioned to you hypertonic. Hypertonic means we have a higher solute concentration. Iso, iso means equal, and so this is going to be an isotonic or an equal concentration. So this way we would have the same concentration on both sides of that semi-permeable membrane. And then finally we have hypotonic again. Hypo means under or below a lower solute concentration. So let's take a look at what this means when we're talking about living cells. So in this diagram, again, we are going to define hypertonic as the solution has a higher solute concentration than the cell. If we're looking at an animal cell, if you put an animal cell into a hypertonic solution, the water will leave the cell because it's gonna move from an area where the water is in a higher concentration to an area where the water is in a lower concentration. Notice here in the plant cell that the water moves in the same direction, but the cell size itself does not change very much because remember, the plant cells have a cell wall around them, so that's gonna be a bit more rigid, and it's gonna give it a bit more structure. So the inside of the cell, the cytoplasm in here, does shrink, but the cell itself remains relatively the same size, okay? Next, we're looking at isotonic. Remember, we defined isotonic as the concentration of the solute is gonna be the same inside and out, and so notice here that water is gonna move into and out of the cell at the same rate. Up here, water seems to be moving out only, but actually water would move in because water does tend to go both ways across the membrane. But the, the net movement of the water is gonna be out, and that's why you see a large arrow here. Notice here, the arrows are the same size, and so what that's saying is that water is moving in and out at relatively the same rate. When we are in an isotonic solution, the cells are actually at something what we call equilibrium. Okay, and that again is just another way to define isotonic because the solutions are both uh, the same inside and out of the cell. In a hypotonic solution, this is a solution that has a lower solute concentration than the cell. And in here, you're going to notice that the water tends to move into the cell. A larger amount of water moves in. There is some water moving out. But eventually what's going to happen to this cell here is if it takes up too much water, it's actually going to burst. Okay, and that is going to uh, 
be very dangerous for the cell. So again, if we add too much water to the cell, it will burst. Over here, if you notice, for the plant cell again, the cell wall is going to keep the cell relatively the same size. If you look again, all the cells are about the same here. But the difference is that the water is moving in, and this is what would happen when you water the plants. Water moves into the cells, and it causes the cells to be very, very rigid, which is why the plants, when you water them, are going to tend to be a bit more firm versus plants when they don't have water in a hypertonic environment. When they don't have water, uh, these are the plants that are going to wilt. Okay, So let's take a look again at our YouTube and our cells combined. So remember when the water moves from an area of high concentration, high concentration of water, this is a hypotonic solution, has a lot of water but it has a low amount of solute, the water is going to move from an area of high concentration to an area of lower concentration of water. So water moves from hypotonic to hypertonic and when the water moves to the hypertonic side, osmotic pressure is created. Okay, and if that osmotic pressure is created in an animal cell, we would eventually burst the cell. Okay, if it happens in a plant cell, it's called turgor pressure, T-U-R-G-O-R, turgor pressure. And that's going to be the pressure that's going to push outwards towards the cell wall, keeping the cell uh, firm. Now, this pressure, again, can damage the cell. Remember, plants can manage this because they have a cell wall. And if you recall in our cell organelle discussion, I mentioned to you that uh, protists have another type of vacuole called a contractile vacuole. And the contractile vacuole, what it does, a protist is a single-celled organism living in a hypotonic environment. And so it's going to act very much like these animal cells here. So if it continues to take in water, it's going to burst and the cell will die. So what it does is it has something called the contractile vacuole, which will collect the water as it moves into the cell, and then it will do what its namesake says. It will contract, basically squeezing the excess water out to help it maintain homeostasis. And homeostasis, if you remember, is the ability to maintain stable conditions. Mm -hmm.